Okay, here's a typical type of problem where we have two objects connected with a rope. We have two objects connected with the rope over a frictionless pulley. So we have a frictionless pulley, two objects connected with the rope, and the question is to find the acceleration and the tension. So let's talk through again how would we do that. So when you're ready, let's suggest a good first step. Are they moving? Or, uh, yeah, we haven't been told. Uh, no, we can't assume that. That might be something we have to figure out. Yeah. So we will create a separate free body diagram for each object. Yeah. Ah, well put. All right. So yeah, create a separate free body diagram. Now the key thing that you said there is a separate diagram for each object. Let's call this object A and this object B. So here's the diagram for object A, and then there's a separate diagram for object B. The key word here is separately. Do we know if they both have we weren't told that in the problem, but we can figure that out. That's a what good question. What if they have the same acceleration because they're attached? Because they're connected. That's right. That's a key problem-solving technique. Um, when things are connected, they have to have the same acceleration. Otherwise, the connection would break, right? If this was accelerating at a different rate than this, the rope would snap. Um, so as long as the rope doesn't snap, we have to assume they have the same acceleration. Generally, we're going to assume that the ropes um, are, are not elastic. They can't just start bending. Um, we're going to assume that the, the rope has a fixed length. Um, so that's an important, uh, important point that you brought up. When objects are connected, um, then they have, to have the, they have to have the same magnitude of acceleration. That's going to be quite important. That depends on the problem. But in this case, they will have the opposite sign. That's a good point. OK, uh, but let's stick with our systematic approach. Um, what do we need to put in our free body diagrams? Well, you're going to put gravity. So what do you mean? So the weight here would be 5 times 9.8. That's 49 newtons? Yes. Good. Well, let's stick with A for a second. Are there any other forces for A? T showing up. We know that we can call rope forces, tension forces. Any other forces on A? No. no. Now, how do we know? Well, we've got the weight. And the only thing that's touching this is the rope. So that's the only thing that another force can come from. Uh, OK, good. So then we go on to B, and what are the forces on B? 68.6 is the weight in the elements. So to find this weight, that would be 7 times 9.8. 68.6 is what you got. Sounds good. And then the same T going up this. Can we assume that these are both the same force? Yes. I think we talked about this last time. If you have a massless rope, it has the same tension everywhere. And you should assume that all the ropes are massless unless the problem tells you not to. I saw there was one problem in the homework where the, the rope had mass, but that's quite rare. Um, uh, almost all the time, the rope is going to have no mass. Um, so even though I didn't say the rope was massless, you should assume that. We're going to assume that this is a massless rope, which is the normal assumption we make unless we have a good reason not to. We've identified all the forces on both of these objects separately for the two objects. Um, and now we should uh, choose our axes and our positive directions. Um, so in this problem, we really don't care about the x component. Um, I guess we might as well choose up as the positive y direction. In fact, maybe we should have done that already, because then we could have said that is this weight positive or negative? Negative. And how about this one? Negative. Yeah, so maybe I should rewrite this to put positive directions uh, Sooner. Well, in any case, you, as, soon as, as soon as possible, you want to put in the signs, because one of the most common mistakes that students make is forgetting the signs. All right, so we've got that. Um, step three is to break things into components. We don't need to. Or another way, another way to put it is, what is the y component of the weight? Negative 49. Yeah, and what's the x component of the weight? So it's obvious what the components are. We don't need to break it into components. Um, and it's, uh, this is already broken into components as well. This is the Y component. All right, um, so now what? So we now write down Newton's second law separately for each object. So how many equations are we going to have? Two. Because right now you don't need to do So we need one equation for object A and one equation for object B, um, but we're only going to do the Y components for each of those. 
So this is the basic framework. Remember when we were doing kinematics, we talked about the framework. Well, the framework there was writing down all five kinematics variables. And on a complicated problem, you might have to write those down more than once. Well, our framework for this problem is writing down Newton's second law. And on a complicated problem, you'll likely have to write that down more than once. All right. Uh, now, step five is to add all the relevant, relevant forces <coughs> on the left side of the equation. What does that mean? Well, that means that now I should just start listing all of the forces over here, all the y forces. So what should I list here on the left-hand side? T minus 49. That's right. And over here, I should list T minus 68.6. And how about what should I put in the right-hand side of this equation? And on the right-hand side of this equation? Okay, and again, as we talked about last time, don't put in 9.8 for A. That's always a mistake. We already used 9.8 when we figured out the masses. Isn't that we're going to set them equal to each other by setting them both equal to T? Good. Now, one thing we have to be careful here, when you have a multiple object problem, I think this is what I said in step seven. For a multiple object problem, the key is use the same symbol for things that are the same and different symbols for things that are different. Well, I'm using the same symbol for both tensions because these are both the same. Are they same in magnitude? Yes. And are they same in direction? Yes. Yeah. But that doesn't have to be the case. On some other problems, they could be different in direction. But here, I can use the same exact symbol for both of those. Maybe to really make that clear, I'll say these have the same magnitude and they're both in the positive direction. But there's other rope problems where um, one te the rope can be pulling in different directions. You have to be careful about that. And we already said the accelerations are the same, but let's be more careful. Are the accelerations the same in direction here? No. no. Ah, I didn't even think about that. So that's going to be important. So let's call this just the magnitude of this acceleration. Remember that I just invented this symbol of a dot to stand for magnitudes. So this is just a made up symbol. This tells us this is a magnitude. Now, what should be the sign on this acceleration, positive or negative? Well, now we have to figure out which way this is going to move. And for that, we should just forget about physics and use common sense. Which way will it move? D is going to drop. B is going to drop. And A is going to go up, just because this is heavier. Right? So before we studied any physics, we already know that this is the one that's going to go down, and this is the one that's going to go up. All right, so now I can put in a positive So how about, yeah, this one should be positive. But over here, I should put in a negative sign. Now, this is a step you really want to highlight in your notes, because students hardly ever get this right. They hardly ever think about the fact that variables can have different signs. So you really have to watch out for that on multiple object problems. A lot of the time in multiple object problems, magnitudes will be the same, but some of the directions will be different. And the best way to deal with that is write down the symbol with a dot to show that they have the same magnitude, and then you put in the sign yourself. That way you know you're getting the right sign for each of those. This is the step that people are most likely to forget. All right, and now um, we're done, because we have two equations and two unknowns. So a mathematician would say that the rest of the problem is trivial. If you have the same number of equations as unknowns, you should be able to use algebra to solve for all the unknowns. Um, the method I like to use is the substitution method. Solve for one variable and substitute into the other equation. So here I could solve <coughs> t equals 49 plus 5a, and then I could substitute that in here. 49 plus 5a minus 68.6 equals negative 7a. Mm -hmm. I got 1.63, is that a metric you guys got? No. I make mistakes a lot, so you should check me. I think it should be 2a, not 12a. No, it is no, 12a. It says negative, so okay. minus 5, minus. Yeah. Oh, oh, I did it. Yeah, you didn't get this? That too. I trust it. <laughs> I get 1.63. Actually, it should come out to be positive. Positive, yes. Sorry. After all, this stands for a magnitude, right? Yes. So the magnitude has to come out positive. If this came out negative, we would know we made a math mistake, because the dot tells us this has to be positive, because it's a magnitude. Uh, this would be in meters per second squared. Mm -hmm. 
So what's the answer to the question? Well, a full answer would be to say that object A is accelerating at 1.63 meters per second squared up, and object B is accelerating at 1.63 meters per second squared down. We want to give the magnitude and direction for each of those. To give a full answer, we have to find the tension as well. But again, that should be trivial. We should just need to plug this into one of our equations. Well, this is the simplest one because it's already solved for t. Newtons. Good. It's good to always think about the units. 